hey, gang, if you're interested in building a large portfolio, how about a billion dollar portfolio? How about a two, three billion dollar portfolio? If you're interested in learning what it takes, the price you need to pay, the success skills you need to learn in order to build a multi-billion dollar portfolio, pay attention to this upcoming video. Let's go! Hey everybody, how's it going? Russell Westcott here. So, hope I got your attention on the very opening tease to today's video. This video was shot at a live environment, back when we used to be able to have a live event. And at that live event, this was shot a couple years ago now, at that live event, I had an opportunity to invite four people, four people that are building a large portfolio of real estate properties. On that panel discussion, we had somebody who is just getting started, somebody who's already grown a portfolio and taking it to the next level, another person who's transacted more than 2,000 properties, and a fourth person that has done over $2 billion, moving on to $3 billion worth of real estate. So there's something for everybody in this upcoming video that you're about to watch. I'm a firm believer in success leaves clues. And on this panel, you're about to learn from some of the best real estate investors around. So pay attention, have a pen and paper ready, bookmark this video, subscribe, because you will be coming to it often. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get after it. Number seven in the process, I firmly believe, is that you need to surround yourself with people that are doing right? Because this is a long and lonely road and it can be fought with a lot of challenges and, and trials. And there's, you know, lots of rejection along the way when you're trying to do this. So we really need to make sure we have the right team of people around us. Okay. And so what I've done is we've assembled a team of experts and a panel that I'm going to have come, come up here and I'll introduce them one at a time. And I'm just going to ask them a couple questions. They come up and then we're going to, I have a lot of questions that I could ask, but more importantly, I want you guys to ask them. Okay. So here's the team. So first of all, Mike, can I get Mike, Mike Bug, come on up here. Let's give Mike a round of applause, please. You sit right there, brother. Yeah. And then you're going to just use, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. You're going to introduce yourself. Alrighty. So Mike Bug is, um, you know, when you meet people in this world and you know that there's something special about them, Mike has it. I don't know what it is, but he has it, right? And um, just the things that he does, the type of person he is, I, there's nothing that's going to stop you from doing whatever you want in your life. I know that for a fact. Um, Mike has just raised his first $250,000 for his first joint venture. Let's give him a round of applause. And I wanted to have Mike on this panel because a lot of you might be in that exact same boat where you're going to be raising your first, first joint venture money. Now, Mike, honestly, how did you feel when I asked you to be part of this panel with knowing who's going to be on the panel with you? Um, definitely like I don't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> that is a true feeling that a lot of we will have, right? It's not, you know, the imposter syndrome. I have the imposter syndrome every single day I get out of bed, right? But sometimes you just have to soldier through it. But honestly, his story, I think, is just phenomenal that if you ever get a chance to hear it and, and his impact he's going to have on this world is going to be awesome. It's just truly amazing. Keep your eye out for this guy. Okay, the next person I have to bring up, Derek Peaver. Derek, come on up. So Derek is, uh, geez, we would have met a long, long time ago, Derek. It would have been at a Rich Dad, Poor Dad event, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Originally, way back then. I've seen Derek evolve from Mr. White Sneaker, you know, he <laughs> did um, and seeing him evolve into this, this powerhouse real estate investor that just methodically nothing stops him, right? He is now past, you know, you're, you're now, I'm not going to tell your number, but you've now taken the leap where you're going, you've done the joint venture thing and you're now taking the leap of just getting into limited partnerships and public raising of capital. Correct. Right? Okay. So this is Derek Peaver. Okay. Thomas Beyer, come on up here, please. Thomas. Hello. Thomas was instrumental to a lot of 
early real estate investors within the community of his, he would tirelessly, there was um, real estate forums, discussion forums and things like that. Thomas would tirelessly answer everybody's question everybody's. He just gave and gave and gave and kept giving back. And he would get up and need these things, infomercials, and he'd come up there and he'd go, hi, I'm Thomas Beyer, rarely a seller. <laughs> and um, lo and behold, bought property after property. 2,000 units was what you peaked out at. Approximately 45 to 50 million in capital raised. Wow. Thomas Beyer, everybody. Yep. The next person that probably doesn't need no introduction, Shecky Green, Mr. Come on up here, Dave Steele, please. Give Dave a round of applause. <laughs> You've only been doing this for about four or five years now, Dave. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, did I read correctly somewhere that you've now, with Western Canadian Properties Group, has now passed the, the B number? Was it 1.2 billion? 1.2. 1.2 billion dollars in transactions. <laughs> and I had a conversation with Dave the other day, and he was just in there, and he goes, he goes, Russell, I'm, and he's, if you know him, he doesn't, he's not boastful at all. And he goes, Russell, I'm not doing this brag of this. Our latest project is of our project down in Atlanta. We, um, we, we oversubscribed by six million or something like that. They raised $11 million in five days. That's the kind of guy I wanna know. <laughs> okay, so high tech here guys. I have microphones that you're gonna pass along and you can just, we'll go along the way here. Okay, and I have a lot of questions and more importantly than the questions I have, I want you guys to have, to have this as well. So number the one question that will always come up that I wanna get your guys' input on is the whole realm around credibility. Right, um, having that credi the credibility as a real estate investor, what would be some of your best advice you would offer to people on how to build your credibility with, with to, to raise capital? Anyone want to? <laughs> They're all, first of all, it's shy and humble, right? <clears throat> Mike, go for it. Uh, for me, because obviously more on the starting out would be accountability. Um, and it doesn't have to just be accountability in real estate. It's how you show up in all areas of your life because people are watching that. So that's, that's been one of the things I've tried to really implement is just show up and stay true to your word in every area. Nice. Um, personally, I find that honesty helps because if you've been in the <laughs> business for, for many years, like I have and, and David, you know, not every deal will be success. Um, hopefully over the long run, you have more successes than failures, but I think it's, in, at least in my case, it helps to admit that you have failures along the way. And, and certainly we bought a lot of stuff in Alberta uh, until about 2014. And of course, as you all know, since 2014, the market has been so hot in Alberta. So some investors have lost some money, right? Um, that's not the norm, but some people have lost money um, in our latest LP, which we opened like six, seven years ago. So I think it's, it's, it helps if you actually admit that and talk about what's going on. So I think often it's better to talk about bad news than no news. Because if you don't tell people anything, they always assume you lost all your money and, and you're gone and you're in Belize and where are you? So, so I think it helps to just send people regular updates and, and you know, I mean, I answer all the emails personally if people ask me what's going on. And I find that builds credibility, even if you perhaps didn't deliver them a decent return, which you had perhaps, perhaps promised, you know, five, six, eight years ago. I think that helps, honesty helps. Um, I think it's easy to have credibility when you've done it for a long time. I'm guessing that a lot of people here are trying to do their first joint venture, raise their first money, right? And the experience that I have of that is, uh, we have a 24 year old daughter and 26 year old son, and I've watched them all decide to go to university or get a job. And the first thing that's called on is what? A reference letter. Hey, give me a reference letter. So I'm on the reference list of all my kids' friends. And so they come one by one and they come knocking on my door. Hey, Dave, will you give me a reference letter? Right? So if you think about it, if you're getting started, you've got eight people. I don't know who they are, but write that list down of eight people. You've got eight people, you know, your neighbor, your 
aunt, your uncle, you've got eight people that if you had to go raise some money in a pinch or you had to go do something, there's eight people you'd go call. Now, the first step may not be going to them to say, will you give me money? But the first step might be to say, will you write a letter to talk about what kind of a person I am? Because it's great for me to tell you who I am. It's really good if I could turn around and go, hey, by the way, here's a here's my next door neighbor. Here's somebody I've worked with, my first job. Here's someone I dealt with. And so the starting point of getting that credibility is having something really simple that someone else says about you. So, you know, it's much easier. You know, I look around the room and I see a whole bunch of people here that have done joint ventures and projects. And, you know, we all have a nice four color flip it open brochure. Here's the 51 properties we bought in the States. Here's the developments we're doing. We've got nice brochures. We've got any award that anybody would ever given us logoed in that brochure. But, you know, what you got to find is what's that What's that starting point, right? That starting point, as soon as you've done two deals, you can do a front and back, nice little eight and a half by 11 with pictures of your deals, your fix and flip in New West or whatever your deal is. But what you really have to do is the credibility is how do you get that credibility really on? And it usually comes, I think, from those first handful of eight or 10 people, you know. Derek? Uh, just quickly, I guess I would just build on, on his point that, um, you know, back when I worked on the tugboats in 2000, you know, and for nine years I did, that was my career in the marine industry. On the, on the tugboats, I'd like to think I had a good reputation as far as, you know, washing the boat every week and painting the boat and doing my share and making sure it was always left as I found it for the next people that came and being known as a producer that, you know, when it was time to work, we would, we would over hustle and not, uh, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, Under hustle. dog it, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so really you prescribe to the, um, how you do anything is how you do everything. Yeah, and, and that was actually how I got a lot of my early momentum with my uh, partners and investors was a lot of my tugboat captains be became my early investors. All right, so let's continue on a theme of first investors. Mike, talk about your, your first investor that you're dealing with right now. Who are they, where, you know, where did they come from? How long have you been working on this yeah. transaction potentially? And what kind of tipped it over the edge for you? Okay. So, so the investor Russell's talking about, I'm, he's, he's my first non-family investor. So, cause I would, I refused to count my family ones. Um, cause I did a bunch of those, but so this guy I've known probably for about 10 years, like we're fantastic friends, play hockey together. And I've been mentioning real estate to him sort of in passing, but for like f probably five years. And he's watched Rosalie and I keep growing our portfolio and keeps asking and seeing us do it. Um, but never pulling the trigger. And I'd kind of offered him some opportunities. And finally, it got to a point of just being like relentless pursuit, um, kind of like tr becoming so successful, they can't ignore you, that he finally was like, okay, you're very serious. I, I kind of want in on this. Yeah, and he just wrote a check for 250000 Yeah, could deposit into a joint account. Yeah. And now you're... Yeah, for him... Like he was basing it entirely on me. He never asked a single question on the deal. Not even one. We argued more about the name of the joint venture. <laughs> that, that, that was so, his sticking point. But in essence, he's just put in 250,000. He's left it up to you to turn the money into projects you see fit. It's more about Mike than it is about the deal. Right? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Derek, your first joint venture partner. Uh, my very first joint venture was a tiny condo in Agassiz for $65,000. <laughs> and uh, we thought we had to go that far to find cash flow. And when I lived in Cloverdale at the time, because you don't know that you can get a bit higher rents than, than maybe what people think you can get. But uh, it was a four-way deal. My very, my very first deal, it was myself, my best friend, my dad, and his dad. We split the 25% down four ways. Uh, Carson and I got the mortgage. And we did all the work. So, you know, the brush nickel conversion, the, the renovation had no idea, just learned how to do baseboards, you know, uh, figure it out as we go. And, uh, we're able to raise the rent, get, get some cash flow out of it. So that's my first deal is starting really so small. So from a $64,000 place in Agassiz, what are you at now? Your portfolio? Uh, it's around uh, 170 titles, which is mainly condos and townhouses, almost all condos and townhouses. <laughs> Thomas. <clears throat> I 
That's a good question because honestly, I don't know who my first investor, <laughs> co-investor was. I know my dad gave me 30 grand to co-invest in the building, but I bought three condos and then three buildings by myself with, with my own money. And then I thought I have enough of a track record to create a story. And as, as Dave mentioned, kind of the brochure was then black and white and it was sort of just in the pre-internet days, you know, in about 2000 when internet and email wasn't so hot as today. But I started to go out and say, look, here's a story. I bought this building at this price, 37, 37 a door. I sold it for 50 a door. I made $20,000. Here's a story. And guess what? There's another building which looks just the same. I can do the same thing. If you give me some money, and there was about six or eight people who came to the table with about a quarter million dollars. And honestly, I don't remember who that was, actually, because they were all not per se close friends, but, but people I knew in my network. We start obviously in a network, right? But what I found is as soon as you go to someone who has money, that person who has money usually has 10 friends who have money too, right? And, and if you deliver a decent return for this one guy in this one building, he will tell all his buddies that, hey, you know, if you get money for the next deal, maybe you should consider that. So that's how you build a network over time. And that's how I did, you know, from 2002 to about 05, I raised about $2 million from perhaps 30 or 40 people. And only then did we do syndications and limited partnerships on a larger scale with offering memorandums. But it was basically small, very small brochures, like you said, you know, two pager, eventually four pages, and eventually color, and eventually more, more content because you have more to tell, right? But I think it always helps to start with your own deal first, uh, and maybe three of them, because right now it's actually not that diff not that hard. I mean, sorry, not that easy to find deals today and say, look, this is a slam dunk, right? You buy in Burnaby today. It's not a given that in two years it's going to be higher, right? It might be flat or slightly down even. So right now it's probably tougher to find a deal which makes sense in sort of the lower mainland especially than perhaps finding the money actually. But I think just do your own deals. If it makes sense, tell people about it. And eventually people will knock on your door. Yeah, it's hard to remember. I mean, for Thomas and I, we're lucky if you remember where we parked our car. <laughs> um, mostly Thomas. Um, so, I mean, the, I, I still remember the first deal. I ended up, <laughs> I ended, we ended up getting a, a gentleman that owned an engineering firm out of Toronto. We bought an apartment building in Calgary and he became a friend and told him about it and, you know, thought he might put in 50 grand and same kind of thing. He said, I'll take the whole thing down. And he bought the building and flew out there, looked around. He goes, I really like this. And, and the thing you'll find is whoever your first joint venture partner is, it's probably where you're going to get a big chunk of additional joint venture partners. So, you know, one of the things I always do is everybody you meet, you just start thinking through whether they're an A, a double A, or a triple A, right? And so you go, what does that mean? It means, you know, are they really an investor? Are they, you know, because you can, once you've done this for a long time, you actually have a, a lot of conversations that you kind of cut to the chase fairly quickly. And a lot of people that are investors really like it. You know, is this something you would do? No. You know, do you want to invest in Saskatchewan? No, I would never go to Saskatchewan. Okay, good. U.S. No, I'm dodging the IRS. Like, so there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that, you know, when you, when you talk to people that have been in the business, you know, guys like Brent that have, that have sold real estate for a long time, a lot of it is, it's, it's people like the cut to the chase. So I think there's a lot to that there. So this, this engineering gentleman put the money in the first deal. He then came back after we looked at the first deal and he said, Hey, we got two more of these apartment buildings in Calgary. He said, I've got a very rich friend in Saudi Arabia. Would you guys like some more money? And literally that guy gave us, that guy literally gave us another like $3 million over the next year. So, so it, you know, it all kind of spins. And then we hired a guy from Century 21 to start calling on every building. We decided the areas in Calgary we wanted to buy. So he started pulling title and calling every building owner. Would you want to sell? Would you want to sell? And finally he came back and there was like one guy, a school teacher from Toronto, and he owned like four buildings. And this guy wouldn't sell, wouldn't sell. So we said, call him back, see if he'd like to invest with us in one that we're going to buy. And he became a partner in one of our next deals, right? So, so it's, it, it's just where, you know, where do they fall out? And I think, you know, there's people that are investors and then there's also people that are going to introduce you to investors. So I think as important as it is to find the circle of investors, it's also finding out how do you connect and get the relationship with those people because as they're getting, as you're pitching them, right, they're really, they're really checking you out. And if at the end, maybe they don't have money or they don't want to do it, but you've invested a good chunk of time getting them to like you and trust you. And if it works, 
then there's a good chance that they've got other people that, that, that they can refer to you. Everybody has eight people. So, Andrew, you've got eight people. So if at the end of the day, I, I'm pretty safe. If, if, if I've got something that, that you like and you don't have something to give them right now, maybe there's a decent chance that, that you, can, you can organize your crew into my deal. So, you know, it's, that's one of the big theories. Dave, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you another quick question, then I'll come back. I'll try to ask you another quick question. Um, you and I, over a coffee, we had a discussion earlier and we had Rick letting out, and we we're talking about agreements. And sometimes we get a little bit freaked out about agreements and you know structures and all these kind of things. You, you shared something that just absolutely floored me of the amount of investors that you have that just sign promissory notes with you. Is that, is that the case or do you have with something yet? And you talked about that one doctor that's invested in every one of your deals. Well, yeah, the, the mic, yeah, sorry. the, the prom notes were way back when, when yeah. we first, but yeah, I mean, people would, everybody's got their view of how they want to structure it. Um, you know, again, what, whatever you do, you know, what, here's what I try to say to people, whatever you do, get known for the, for what you are. Right. If I if I think of Thomas, I think of properties in Alberta. Right. If I think of Derek, I think of, you know, furnished furnished rentals. So if you, if you think of me, God knows what you think about. But hopefully you think about, you know, the top markets in B.C. and investing in multifamily in the U.S. Right. So get known for whatever that is. If you're the Abbotsford guy or if you're the you know, if you're the Langley person, but tr try to if you're really going to raise the money get known for that. Are you known for fix and flips? Are you known for buying new stuff? Are you known for building? But but get known for it because then you've got a repeatable story. And then the second part to that is when you do your documentation, try to, to almost never change it. Don't go from one deal that later there's a different deal because every time you do a new deal, you've got to start everybody all the way off at ground zero. So when I say people have invested, we've bought 51 of these apartment buildings down in the States. And I have one doctor client who's invested in all 51 of them. Now, if I had, if, if he had a told, if I had told him when I first met him that he would have put, gone into 51, there's no way he would have. He would have just said, Dave, you're crazy. Right. But literally we'll go, we'll have a cup of coffee. I'll show him the deal. He'll go, yeah, this is good. Same as the other deals. Yeah. Structure's exactly the same. Fees are the same. Splits are the same. Everything's the same. Okay, good. So that saves a whole step in the process of not having to go through, oh yeah, no, the deal isn't this anymore. It's this split, it's that split. So you, you know, you're able to really streamline the, the person's decision-making process. I, I imagine make, making people money will want them to come back and invest some more too. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mike, we're gonna have a conversation quickly about um, a lot of people have fear of money conversations with people. Do you, did you have that? Do you have that? And have you had to overcome it? Uh, yeah, I would say like I do. I love having money conversations, um, but it can be like uncomfortable. And really what flipped since working with Russell is looking at it of being of service. It's not, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to get their money. I'm trying to like help them use their money. And when you completely flip the angle on how you come at it, um, that's totally changed it for me. So now I, I love the muddy conversations because it's all about how do you be of service to them? And if it's not a fit, no problem. I'm not attached to the outcome. Good, good student. <laughs> Derek, Derek, how would you? Same question. Yeah, so I'm uh, a longtime student of Russell Westcott too. I first heard about his programs and stuff on joint ventures in 2006 when I still had a job. So it was a big part of how I was able to, you know, turn it into a business and, and listen to all the CDs on overcoming the typical objections. You know, I would just listen to the CDs in my car. I never worked through the paperwork in the, in the package, just the CDs a hundred times. And, uh, you know, we had so many meetings at, at people's homes that all, you know, we thought they were in for sure. And then they, they wind up not being for whatever reason. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just a number, numbers game. I remember you used to say some will, some won't. So what? Someone's waiting. Um, but you know, nowadays when I, when I go into a meeting like that, I'm just hundred percent about, I almost hope that I wind up just helping them and, you know, go do it on your own or, or how can I help you? I really don't want anything. And then it's almost like they'll, you know, more inclined, they, they want it. They want to do the deal then, um, instead of, you know, that, uh, attraction, attraction versus pursuit, right? 
Thomas, same question for you. Fear. Of... So fear stands for false evidence appearing real. So you have to ask yourself first what, what false evidence is in your mind, perhaps, why you might not want to ask this question. And maybe you're going to fail, or interest rate's going to go up, or Burnaby's going to go tank, everyone leaves Burnaby, and there'll be a you know, uh, desert in, in Burnaby, and therefore shouldn't buy in Burnaby. Whatever is happening in your brain, you should get rid of that. Um, but people with money really always have to think about what do I do with the money, right? Because they go, you know, look at the stock market today, right? I mean, it goes up and down, and people say, gee, I bought some stocks that did really well last two years, but now it starts to yo-yo, and all of a sudden, every day it goes you know, up and down. That's a real fear of people who have money. So if you say, look, here's a deal, I'm going to buy this building, or buy this mobile home park in our case, or development deal, or you know, a furnished suite, and, and here's the story, and I believe in the story because it, you know, if I had more money, I'd do it myself. I wouldn't ask you, right? But I don't have enough money, so therefore I'm asking you. Um, we stopped fundraising in Alberta in 2015. My, my son, who's a medical doctor, or now is, is one, but then he was a student, had some line of credit, right? I can borrow money at one and a half percent. That's awesome. Should I, should I put that money in your deal? And I realized, you know what? No, you should not. And then I realized I cannot even recommend this investment to my son. Then I should not raise money from anyone else. So we stopped fundraising and sure enough, Alberta, as you know, in the last three years didn't do so well. So it was the right call. So I think you have to ask yourself first, is this a good deal? And if you had all the money yourself, would you put it in there? And if the answer is a resounding yes, then absolutely, you should not be shy to ask people for money and talk about it. Um, but as you know, David said earlier, some people just don't care because they might not like Burnaby, or they might not like the US, or they might not like Saskatchewan, or they have certain perceptions about certain things, They're like old apartment buildings. If I only knew, okay, fine. So you, you gotta sort of weed out um, the crap, you know, from the, from the, what do you call this? Weed from the trap, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and I, I like email personally, probably way too much than, than personal calls, but if you send one email to 100 people, the 10 people who think this is a good deal will raise their arm or, or respond. The other 90 will not do anything. So there's no harm sending an email. So here's an opportunity. I need a million dollars. I need 20 people at 50,000 a piece. The guys who have the money will say, sure, send me some more information. The 90% of folks who say, look, right now, I don't have money, or no, I don't like the US, or I don't like mobile home parks, or whatever the story is. They won't tell you anything, right? So you haven't lost anything. So therefore, it's, it's okay to ask, right? Just always be ready to ask. I have a book issue out there, which I think David wrote a chapter in, and I wrote a chapter in with Audi Jurek, which talks about always ask, be ready to ask for money. So if you honestly believe in the deal, don't be shy to talk about it. If people are interested, now if you go to a Christmas party, and you talk about the weather, and the last trip to Hawaii, well then, you know, don't talk about the, the latest mobile home park deal you have on the plate, because some people just don't honestly give a damn about your deal, and they don't have money anyway, right? So don't waste your time with people who don't have the money. Um, but you will find, especially if you're in circles where, where there is money, that people are always interested in, in listening to your story for a few minutes. And then zip it, of course, right? Be, be mindful of the social social cues they give you. I'll tell you an interesting thing about just an email, funny thing, just as you said that. So we send out a lot of emails. We send out two or three times a week and they go out, you know, these big blasts that so, you know, everybody probably gets them from all kinds of people, right? So I, so I, I don't know, if, a few years ago, I, I was like, you know, this is crazy. This email blast went out and I didn't get one response. Like it, it went to all my clients, all my people, but I, like nobody called me, nobody replied. So I started saying, look, just don't send it to my clients. I would take the email. So the email blast was designed at the bottom and I would just put a little note. Hey, Bob, uh, you know, if this is of interest, give me a call. You know, hey, Tom, hey, Kevin, you know, what's going on? Hope you're doing well. And I went from literally a 1% response rate to an 85% response rate. Now, all the 85s weren't good, but it was, but so, so it, but it meant that someone would say, hey, Dave, thanks a lot. You know, just, you know, we're buying a new family car. I'm not, not investing right now, or my daughter's going to college, but they would take the time to actually reply to you, right? So the difference was when they see the master email, they just think it's a, an en masse and they're not supposed to do anything as soon as you can get some kind of correspondence. So if you think about it and you go back to this concept of triple A, double A and single A, right? Why would you ever send a master blast to your 20 or your 25 in your triple A? 
If you know that the, 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 op, the return rate is going to be 1%, you better make sure that there's some kind of personal email going to at least your AAA and your AA, right? So if you're doing that to get any interest, it, it, it just makes a huge difference. All right, I, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Finally, puberty. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? Anyone have score? questions? Questions? Hey, do you guys realize there's like uh, a billion, billion dollars of real estate up there? <laughs> Marcus, can billion. you run the mic? It's Marcus or Avery. Thank you. Is it on? It should be. Perfect. Uh, so, I, like I know Dave, you structure yours different now because you've just gotten to that level. But when you guys were doing your early JVs, did you always structure in a way that you shared liability on a loss? Was it a win-win loss-loss, or did you guys have it set up in a way that you were a working partner, but you didn't share liability? I'm not sure where Russ went. Yeah. So, I mean, liability comes in two things. I think he's recording it. I mean, in almost all JVs, depends on the structure. Is If you sign up for a mortgage, you can lose more than you invest, right? Um, in, if, if you do a limited partnership, for example, by law, you cannot lose more than you invest. So there is, I send a personal guarantee on, on a mortgage if the building blows up and there's no fire insurance and it burns down and there's massive losses by tenants and I'm on a hook, but you're not. I mean, you lose probably all your money, but that's the, the maximum loss. I'm not sure what that, what, what that's the question, but, but if you do a JV, a traditional JV, where perhaps you co-sign a mortgage with, with the expert, I'm but, asking if you're just behind the scenes, you're the working partner. So you're not qualifying in any way. You're just 50% beneficiary owner. You're managing everything. You share the risk with the cash partner. And I'm asking how you guys did it. How do you do it? That's a big question. Go ahead first. Sure. So that's, that's basically all I've done to this point is joint ventures just recently started limited partnership. But uh, it's always been 100% performance based pay. You know, if, if it's vacant or if there's vandalism or something, we're always on the hook. Heaven forbid we hold five, 10 years, sell the asset, and the investor doesn't get back their entire 100,000, for example, we would be on the hook for our share of the loss. So, um, you know, we don't put in any fees or any upcharges or anything like that. It's just 100% performance-based pay for better or for worse. Same thing, on the hook for 100% of the loss. Uh, no, 50, 50 percent of the loss, the, your share of the loss. You know, the thing I would say, if if you had a deal right now, how many people, by show of hands, could stand up right now and tell exactly in one sentence what the split would be you'd do on the deal? One. Okay, because if you leave here with one thing from Russell, whatever the deal is, so I'm doing projects right now in Fort St. John, I would do a deal right now, I'd put up 50% of the equity, someone else puts up the other 50% and qualifies for the mortgage, and they get 60% of the deal. 60, 40, we split the cash flow, they get 60, I get 40, I put up 50% of the money. So I could say that, I could, I could rattle it off as quick as I need to. So whatever your deal is, if your deal is I've got a project in, in Coquitlam and I'm looking for a joint venture partner, you need to be able to go right to what your deal is so that, so that, cause it's amazing when I ask people how many people him and haw and they're not quite sure exactly what it is. And it's generally a pretty standard, it's a pretty standard way that you're going to go do it. Um, in this, book here, which some of you might have read or seen, this is called 80 Lessons Learned on the Road from 80,000 to 80 Million. One lesson I talk about is, is uh, the three returns on a real estate deal, the three, th three forms of money. And so one is green money, which is the check you write. Someone needs to get a return on the check you write. But someone else qualifies for the mortgage, which I call red money, right? Someone needs to get a return on that. We just take on risk, right? If you sign a mortgage, there's risk. And one is, I call blue money, which is all the work you're doing, looking for the deal and putting the deal together and, and actually buying it and managing it. So you got to look at the, the three sort of, let's call them profit centers for the red money, the green money, and the blue money, and need to allocate a percentage for each of these three pieces. And the classic model is perhaps 50-50. To me, it means the green guy gets 50%, but the mortgage guy which signs up for the mortgage gets 20% and the guy who has the real work gets 30%. So if Derek signs up for the mortgage himself, 
and does all the work, but I put the money in, then it's 50-50. But if I sign a mortgage too, and he too, well, that's maybe you split the 20% or 60-40. <coughs> but if I sign up for the mortgage and put the money in, and, and all he does is look for the, the deal and does it work, that's not worth 50% to me as the investor. That's worth 30%. But that's my view of the world. doesn't mean it's the right view of the world, but that's just how what makes sense to me. So in the end, when you structure a deal, it has to make sense to you as the guy doing the deal, but it has to be obviously sellable and believable in the real world and acceptable to the money partner. And they might say, well, look, if you take 50%, that's not fair. I put up, you put up no money. Yeah, but you sign up for the mortgage and you spend six months looking for a deal, which is you know not so easy these days, right? So in the end, you have to sell that, but but you have to be able to, to uh, articulate as, as they've said, very quickly what you're selling and you know, what the proposition is. But can you lose more than you invest? Potentially, yes, depending on the, on the mortgage sign-up you, you have to, you, you ask to do, right? And there are some deals where there's actually clauses in larger deals where there is actually cash call provision. That's not typically a limited partnership, but there might be share structures where it actually says, thou shalt be, we might call you for more money. There's actually a cash call provision. I have never invested in those and never done them myself, but those deals exist. So be, be mindful that that does exist. I just wanted to add a real quick point that I learned because uh, a lot of us are at the joint venture stage, un unlike Thomas and, and Dave that are dealing with securities and stuff like that, is that every joint venture you do should be seen as negotiable. Although you can quickly articulate what it typically is, uh, you can't say that, take it or leave it. It is what it is because you could be seen as selling a fixed security. So. You know, I always say this is the typical deal, but you know, if you if I want to get the mortgage and you don't, we can adjust it so to be seen as it's open, not take it or leave it. And when we first started doing the joint ventures, I used to keep a little card because every time I'd meet a guy like Derek, I'd go, hey, what's your deal? What do you charge? And I'd write it all down because it was amazing how different they all are, right? And, and every, and, and you're exactly right. There's sort of a starting point and then there's an end point because someone says, hey, this is great, but I'd like to give you this much money. So now all of a sudden you go, darn, I just like put the best the best offer I have on the table. There's really nowhere more to go. So if, you know, if you're, if you've got someone that wants to do joint ventures, it's, it's, I used to keep this little card because I couldn't keep track of them all and be like, that guy's, oh, that's a cool structure. But then once, once you get them, you really understand because, because as what Thomas says, everybody has these high level conversations about blue money, green money and red money, but what does it really mean when you're sitting face to face with someone? Hey, I've got this property. I'm looking for this money. Do you want them to sign for the mortgage? Are you going to sign for the mortgage? Are you both going to sign for the mortgage? You know, so, so you, you cut through that very quickly and you don't go, well, it doesn't really matter to me. I could sign for it or you could sign for it. You go, no, I'm looking for someone. I want you to sign for the mortgage. I want you to put up this much money. I'm flexible on how much money you put up. But if you put up half and I put up half, here's what the split would look like. Right. And I think, you know, so, so you, you, you go looking for exactly what you want. And then you know, you know where you can move to if someone says, Hey, I don't have that much money or I can get the mortgage. Hey, would you put up 75% of the money and I'll put up 25% and get the mortgage? Sure. Let's talk about what that split would look like. Yeah. I have, uh, I have several uh, joint venture uh, people that have, I have with different projects and I'd like to scale and get to larger projects. And so what would you, be your feedback in terms of how I can set it up in a way that protects uh, my, my partners, myself, and being safe from the Securities Commission, because you, you've set up with, you know, you're buying apartment buildings, so you, you, it's hard to just have one partner and, and even myself be able to come up with that kind of money. So can you maybe explain, explain some of how you've done that? Sure. Well, at some point, you cross the boundary from real estate into securities, and, and that boundary is I would say it's not well defined because you can say if you have two guys putting up money, that's a security and now you're selling securities. It's usually something like a dozen people perhaps. It's very common that three, four, five, twelve guys together buy something like a commercial property or multifamily building. That's very common and, and often they know each other and therefore one of the exemptions is called the friends and family and close business associates exemption. So if you look up what's called NI, National Instrument 45-106, do a search on that in Google. That's the 
the long definition of, of what a security is in Canada and what exemptions exist. And one is friends and family and one is uh, close business associates and one is called accredited investors, which are high net worth individuals with an income of over 200,000 a year or financial assets over a million, which does not include your house. And it does not include, by the way, your dental practice if you're a dentist. So there might be a, a, a dentist worth $10 million, but he has $5 million in his dental practice and $4 million or $4.5 million in his house in Best Van and half a million bucks in RSP. He's actually not accredited because that's not a financial asset, his house and his dental practice. But as long as he signs a document which says, I'm, a, I'm accredited, at least he has got some, you know, butt covering document for you. Um, what, once you go to the average person who now doesn't have that kind of net worth, you need to have a, an offering memorandum, which is a lengthy document, which costs you between five and $50,000 to produce, depending on the complexity. A and now you can raise money from what's so-called eligible investors, which are people who make 70,000 a year and, and have, or have less net worth. A and we've used that model for almost a decade now, but that's expensive to set up, right? And you got to raise probably at least a million dollars for, for the cost to make sense because you spend 50 grand on a lawyer and maybe pay some finder's fee now to some people who help you raise the money, which maybe is another five, six, seven, eight percent. You're in a hundred grand figure just to raise the money, right? So even maybe a million is not high enough and not, you got to go above that. But that's another l longer topic and the, the rules are changing, I think, in March actually. So you got to be mindful and, and spend some time and some more conversations with lawyers on that subject. Um, and no one does anything until it goes sideways, right? Um, and there's reporting requirements and you have to file paper with the security commission and then look it up and all of a sudden you're online. There's actually the BC security, bcsc.bc.ca, I think is the website. You type in, you know, David's name or my name or any person's name or any venture name, you see OMs have been doing or deals have been doing. It's, it's a very public website all of a sudden. So you want to make sure, want to think about whether you want to actually be in that space. You know, there is, there is a beauty to stay small and just raise money in your circle of influence and keep it sort of, you know, in the, in the family, so to speak. You have some insights in that, Derek, don't you? It's here. It's here. Yeah, basically, I, I got to a point where I thought, you know, it was um, pushing the limits on the friends and family exemptions. So we grew into the the limited partnership and we use an exempt market dealer, Hawkeye Wealth. So at least when securities comes knocking, I, you know, I can say, well, you know, I proactively took this next step. We pay them a lot of fees to make sure we're in compliance and we're trying to, to grow in the system and not, you know, be on the outside of it. So I don't have a lot more to add on. Oh, we're at the lower end of the scale that, that Thomas mentioned for, for our offering memorandum. And, and, and we're only dealing actually on this first one with accredited investors, just to keep it really simple. But obviously, that's a little li limiting as well. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Uh, it's great to be here uh, hearing your stories uh, directly. Um, I've been in, uh, an investor for a long time, modest uh, success. As, as I hear your stories and continue in this business, I keep thinking this is so much hard work because I've been working in another career as well. And I've never really hired people. I've done it all myself. I bought 30 properties in 30 years and it's a hell of a lot of headaches and work. So I guess my question is, at what point have you guys started, uh, especially the younger guys, but Dave and uh, Thomas, you guys remember, <laughs> um, pardon me. I'm looking to hire four smart guys too, because I think I need help. So, uh, the comments on, uh, at what point, you know, like bookkeeper, my books, you know, I'm not a bookkeeper and, uh, you know, it is a lot of work. I worked overseas juggling everything. So, uh, rushing back to unplug toilets and manage managers and do it all the hard way over 30 years. So I'd like to keep doing it, but I need to do it smarter. So that's my question. Where you started with? the help you needed and uh, any tips on, on that front. So we're at uh, a similar portfolio size and we did everything for the first six years. And we just started with working with Russell that creating it to be scalable and outsourcing. So we finally have brought like third party management in. But I mean, if I could do it 
over again, I would have brought that in way sooner and, and built it sort of with the end in mind. Cause yeah, we were, we were both working and you'd be three in the morning, three in the morning trying to get a property turned over and it almost kills you. So my advice, like as someone that's going through it right now is start right from the beginning. Like if you have that intention of growth, put the systems in place from day one. Uh, well, a couple of little tips from me is I, I started a, the really low end renting to inmate families and, you know, crazy stuff. Um, the higher end, the property, in my experience, has, has made it a lot smoother ride. If you're in a very desirable, you know, new area with master plan communities and amenities, and it makes the life of the landlord a bit more pleasant experience along the ride. Port Alberni? I'm not there. Um, we try to stick to major, major markets for them for the most part. But the other point I wanted to make was that I've used property managers before for stuff in Red Deer that we've owned since 2010, been through a lot of turnover. Um, whereas now as we've expanded across Canada, whether it's Calgary or Edmonton or Ottawa, we give the local boots on the ground half of our ownership, which is typically 25%. Because I know that they're going to get there early. They're going to keep the property in excellent condition. They're going to, you know, go the extra mile and you find the right person and incentivize them really well. And 20, 25% half of, of uh, the management ownership to the boots on the ground. And that's one way we've managed to leverage and, and, you know, not fail with a lot of vacancy and things. Cause he's on, he doesn't get paid unless it's rented. So, um, I, th I think it's a highly personal answer because it really depends on the individual. So if you've done well with 30 properties with a very small bookkeeping team, hats off to you, my friend. Oh, yeah. So so the question that is, why should you go bigger and bring on partners or property managers? So I think it's really more of a personal question. Uh, again, one chapter in the book I talk about is, is what are you good at? Right. So you can create this list on your fridge if you want and maybe ask people who know you well. And it's this five categories, like, like what am I really good at? What am I good at? What am I just average at? What am I poor at? And what am I lousy at? And you put things you have to do on a daily basis in that and say, well, I really should in the end do more things I'm really good at because you tend to enjoy those. And it, I do a lot less or none of the things I'm really lousy at, right? And start from that list and therefore bring on staff or consultants or partners to, to flush that out. So I realized, for example, unlike David, who is probably a born salesperson, I am not. I was on commission at IBM for three years. I did actually quarter for three years, but I didn't really particularly enjoy that, right? So I was raising about $2 million until about 05 by myself and the phone would ring off the hook. I got 30 investors or so, and I got a hundred more calls coming in. I said, look, I need help. I, I, I don't enjoy per se talking to investors all the time, right? I need someone to, to do that for me. And I brought on a partner and we grew the business from there, right? That did work for me. We ended up buying a bunch of buildings in smaller markets like Fox, Fox Creek. I was the biggest landlord there, which is a halfway to Grand Prairie from Edmonton in Camrose. We owned 80, 120 units there. We were the biggest landlord in Camrose and we're Tasquin in, in Yorkton. We had 100 units there. Uh, Paul River, we owned 100 units. It's like all these crappy little markets. And I realized I need help managing all these properties. So I actually opened the, my own property management firm. But I realized right away, I will not be the property manager. I'm, I'm, I don't want to deal with tenants on a daily basis. It's, it's a special skill, right? Um, and I hired a person right away for that company. He got 30% of the, of the company. I set it all up. We had 400 suites under management. And I thought this is sufficient to break even, but it was not. We actually lost money for the first two years. Um, that company still exists today. We manage about 1,500 units. So it's another profit center. But I'm, I was always just a shareholder or maybe a director, but never the operator. Mm -hmm. So you have to, I think, distinguish between ownership and operations. So you might still be the owner of the business, but now you find people in that company who operate it. And they might be co-owners or partners, or they might just be employees with a bonus structure. And sometimes I think maybe I should have not grown as big and maybe stayed smaller like you. There's benefits to that. It's not necessarily better to be bigger because there's more investors now calling on you. There's more stress. There's more things which can go wrong. There's the negative one here still. Exactly. Actually, it was black like yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So there is, there's no right or wrong answer because some people thrive really well as a small accountant with, with a, a small practice of 10 or 12, 15 clients. And some people love to be PricewaterhouseCoopers with 10,000 clients. I mean, there's nothing per se right or wrong with either. I think you have to go introspectively perhaps into your own life desires and goals, what works for you, and then work backwards from there. And, and so that the business serves your personal needs as opposed to the other way around. Right. And we can talk about partners, you know, and there's all sorts of stories and probably another book to write about things which can go wrong, right, or right. Mm -hmm. Like my first business before real estate was a software company. My goal was to make a million dollars, which I, which I achieved after about four or five years. And my partner's goal was to get married, which he also achieved after the same, about the same time. And all of a sudden we had both achieved our goals. And guess what? Ever since the partnership started to unravel, right? We, you know, it was actually good for us. We both made money together. It worked quite well for seven, eight years. But somewhere just to find the goals and then work backwards from there. Cool. Um, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, I don't think bigger is better, but bigger is easier. I mean, I would definitely tell you that when you can take any one part of your business and hire somebody really good, you know, then, then your only real decision is do you have the person in charge of property management? You know, in our case, it's asset management. So we have, we have a full time asset management team that manages the property managers. So we require that we are on site at every property every week. Why? Because the people we buy the buildings from, we're buying them because the sign is leaning over, the pool furniture has rips in it. You know, it's all those things because it's being operated by two school teachers that don't live in Phoenix. There's two school teachers that live in Seattle or two dentists that live in Austin, Texas. And so our system is we have asset managers that go there and they drive the on-site leasing team to convert a high percentage of leads into leases. So we have the highest conversion rate of anybody. So the bigger doesn't mean it's big isn't what's good. What's good is that you can actually take people and all they do every day is they do that part of their job. They know exactly what websites to go advertise on to get the leads. Now, if I have 10 properties, I'm gonna be just like the two school teachers I'm going to get to them when I can get to them. So, so I think there's, I think there's a benefit to getting to a size because, you know, what I really believe in this business, you know, in our company, we call it the need for speed. You know, everything you can do, if you're sitting and planning, how do I, how do I do that a day faster? How do I, you know, what are all the things I can do? Cause traditionally everything in property management has been really slow. So how do I get the delinquencies move faster? How do I get notices delivered earlier? Like what are the things that I can do when I take over a building? What are all the things I can do on takeover that most people don't even do till they've owned the building for two or three months? You know, the day I take over, I want to change the signs. I want to fix that up. So, so big isn't better, but it, it lets you specialize. The speed of money is right. And then the other one, the final one, and it's exactly what Thomas said. And I really think this is, you know, you look around this room, the real honest conversation you should have with yourself is, am I the money raised person? If I'm going to do this, am I the money raised person or am I the operations person? Okay. My partner, Janet, who's 37, computer scientist, she's a whiz. She lives, eats and breathes operations, mm -hmm. but she wouldn't want to do this today. Like to give up her Saturday to come, she has two young kids to do this, to raise money. It's just not what she wants to do, right? So from her perspective, the fact that I'm involved in raising the money is a huge win for her. And the fact that she's the operations person is a huge win for me. So I would say, look around the room and actually say to yourself, is there a money raised person here that I should actually, you know, there's the money raised guy and there's the operations guy. How do I, you know, I think those are, those might be the, the real truer partnerships if, if you're at a few properties and you, and you ultimately want to get a bit bigger. Hey, um, thanks Russell for being out here, putting this all together. It's an amazing event and thanks for everyone coming out. Um, what you guys have accomplished is quite amazing. Um, and it's pretty cool to hear you guys' stories, but, uh, where do you guys see yourselves taking in the next like five, five years? Like where's your guys' future going? I would say it's it's actually more important what do you want what do you want because I think what we want is almost doesn't matter because in the end what you do with real estate should serve your life purpose right mm -hmm. so real estate should serve your life 
And it has served me really well. So I've got two kids now in Edmonton and they're in their careers and they're successful in houses and they love it and they're married and, you know, so I've done well. So honestly, looking forward to me, it's, it's not really that important to me, right? I'm doing some real estate deals right now in Okanagan. I have a partner I had to eject from the business. So I'm at the moment cleaning up a lot of messes actually. So hence the comment, Terry, that being bigger is not necessarily better. So I, I violated what I call a swan rule. Sleep well at night is, is, is paramount, right? So sometimes you, you make mistakes or you, you do decisions in life, right? Like you marry someone, right? You, you meet this beautiful woman or man, perhaps, um, <laughs> and you get married <laughs> and, 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 and you don't know what, 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 what turns out. You think it's going to be a great marriage, but maybe after two years it falls apart or after 10 years and you don't know, right? I mean, I, I was blessed with an awesome marriage and we have been, had just our 30 year anniversary a few months ago. So, but you don't know that, right? You, 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 and that's why chapter one of my book is called Man Plans and God Laughs. Because you have no fucking clue. You buy a building in Phoenix and it might do really well. And if you've done 10 buildings, there's a very good chance that the 11th building will do just as good, right? But if you're just starting and let's say you want to move from single family into multifamily, there's a lot of things which, which can go wrong, right? And that's why I think it's, it's good to have, you know, be in a circle like, like, uh, like Russell's here to see what, what actually works. So if you need to raise more money, that doesn't help you on the deal side, obviously, but it helps you set up a structure so you can raise more money. So if that's important to you, then I think joining, for example, Russell's, um, mentorship program here is, 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 is money well spent because now we get better in that money's raising side, right? You might still screw up that deal, deal in Burnaby. It's a totally different skill set, right? And maybe you want to therefore partner with someone who actually loves to do these deals. So coming back to what Dave said, what I said earlier, be, be mindful what you're good at, right? So if you love to talk to people and love to raise money and be on the phone a lot, and love to be pitches and stuff, but then maybe raise the money and find some other guy or gal to look at the deals, right? Because right now finding deals which make sense is, is not easy, right? Um, especially in a market which sort of, you know, flattish right now in a socialist country we're in, you know? Um, so at the moment, my, my goal is to, to uh, clean up my messes and have an easier life and actually work less. That's my goal. Thank you. I give myself a raise by <laughs> lessons. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree with the, everything that he said for sure. I, I'll just answer it a little different, uh, different way. Um, what, one area where I think there's a lot of opportunity right now is in seniors housing. And I'll just take a quick minute to explain kind of what, what we're doing because you can do it as well is we, we have three sizes of deals that we're doing large, medium and small. So an example of a large deal is in Abbotsford, a group of us bought a big block of condos, um, the fifth to 10th floor. And in the bottom, there's complimentary commercial like bistro, pharmacy, doctors, resort style amenities. The big three things that we include is the director of client experience, which is kind of like a director of care at an independent or assisted living, but we're doing more of an active independent living. And then there's aging in place renovations and aging in place technology. And what we do is we do another long list of, you know, bi-weekly housekeeping, turnkey utility packages, just really package it all up in an all-inclusive. And that's kind of the, the big deal. The medium deal is in residential neighborhoods, homes could be new or converted to uh, more of a personalized, you know, six to 12 resident program with a floating director of client experience or concierge that could come from one of the big projects or manage multiple medium size projects. And then the one that I'm really excited about that we're bu building a website right now is just individual condos and townhouses that form, you know, a portfolio of properties, typically uh, garden suites, you know, two bed, two baths, close to the elevator, best parking. And it's just in the way you package it up and market it and give a high level of service because we've been renting to seniors for a long time since I got into this and, and they're the best tenants. So it's, it's also a big need, especially if you can do affordable stuff. The, the need is incredible. Um, if you go for a bit like higher, higher end stuff that we like to do, it, it's still really good. But if you could provide affordable senior housing, you know, there's grants available for seniors to, um, even renovate. That's another little company we're getting going is the aging in place renovation business to help seniors stay in their home longer until they are ready for one of our options. Thank you.
Okay, so for me, how I'm going to answer this, it kind of doesn't even follow with with real estate necessarily. Um, sort of the journey I've been on in the, the last year. So as Russell mentioned, I recently quit my career. Um, so I was really motivation motivated by desperation up until this point, like build my portfolio so I can leave my job and change my life. And so it was all about myself. And we've got to a place now where, where that's tipped and our portfolio can support our lifestyle at this point. And it's really changed. Now it's not about how many houses can I buy and how much is my net worth. It's what's the impact that that has on that joint venture. So the example that Russell did there with, with the why being golfing in Maui, that's the stuff that now gets me fired up. So sort of to answer your question, sort of really broadly, I would say my next five years is going to be stepping more into impact. Um, try, so, so my goals now aren't even number of doors, it's number of people's lives you can change. So that's, that's the direction. Um, <clears throat> kind of a rewind. Seven, 17 years ago, I retired. And uh, yeah, I know. That's what that's what uh, Brent said when I showed up at the REAG meeting. Um, so 17 years ago, I retired and people said, what are you going to do? And I said, uh, I don't know. I'm going to watch Oprah in the afternoon. And, uh, and I did. I literally religiously watched Oprah every single day. And people would say, well, Dave, do you want to go for a coffee? And I go, yeah, I can't go between two and three. And they go, why not? And I go, Oprah's on. And they, they're like, you're, you're joking, right? And I go, no, I'm dead serious. So, so that lasted six years. Six years. And what my kids were at an age where, uh, you know, they were nine and 10. And I wanted to, uh, you know, my partner was living in Phoenix and he was buying buildings all over, all over Washington, California, Nevada, Oregon. And, and he would be like, Hey, I got this deal in San Francisco. I want you to come down and look for it. And I go, well, I don't really want to go. And he go, why not? And I go, well, my son's got a hockey game tonight and I'd way rather see his hockey game than go look at another bloody building in San Francisco. And then I thought, you know what? Eventually I'm going to make a mistake here and I'm going to try to buy something where I'm half paying attention. So that's when I retired. So that was 17 years ago. And when I got to the end of the retirement, um, people started coming to me and they would say, Dave, you know, we got to go for coffee. And I go, why? And they go, well, I got this deal I want you to look at. And I go, okay, well, what's the deal? And they go, well, it's only a day a week. And okay, that's the first, th I call that the big lie, right? Because, well, first of all, they got a deal and it's only a one day a week. It's a lousy deal. Like if it only needs a day a week of your time, then, but the real hook is they get you in for a day a week. And then next thing you know, you know, you're there and you're working two days a week. And next thing you're doing, like all of us, you're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, right? So, so that kind of happened. And we started, you know, we started, you know, buying, buying and buying again. So, you know, I'm now at the point where, you know, I turn 60 next year and, you know, my goal next year is I'm taking one month each quarter off. So I've already pre-booked most of the first three quarters of the year. So I'm taking a month off. You know, I, I guess, you know, the problem is, is you go, you know, when you get out of it, you know, once you're out, kind of you're out. Because I look back now and I go, man, if only, you know, from a business standpoint, God, if I only had those six years, right? Like I was, you know, this was going like this. And then literally we just stopped. I didn't do anything for six years. And then you decide you're going to get back into it and you kind of got to relearn the market and who raises money and how's, where's the buildings and, you know, how does it all work again? So it was like, you know, it was a full stop and start again. So, you know, I look at it now and I go, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm definitely not ready. I don't want to, I'm not involved. I'm not overly involved in the day to day. You know, Janet really runs the company and Jim's our C, uh, CEO of our, of our uh, property development company here in BC. So, you know, I'm still quite involved in, in, in raising the money, but I'm not there every day. So, so, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer because I think, you know, I, I think once you fully say you're going to step off, then, you know, it's sort of, you're off, right? And so I just get a buzz out of real estate too. So that keeps me excited. <laughs> One thing which is really nice about real estate is that it is, it can be a very satisfying part-time profession, right? Because let's say you want to buy buildings in Phoenix. Um, you can do that and fly down every other week or once a month for three, four days and, and get a meaningful appreciation of, of the Phoenix marketplace as one example, right? 
And then you can find a local property manager who manages properly and, and, and you supervise this person. And then you decide how busy you want to be, right? And then you can take that model and move it to Denver and Seattle and Portland and Atlanta at the same time. And now you're busy full time. Or you say, nope, Phoenix is good enough, big enough a market. And I stay there and I work, you know, two days a week or two days a month or how much you want. So I think that's one of the really nice things about real estate that there's always opportunities somewhere. It might not be currently maybe in a lower mainland in a flattish market, but maybe it's in Seattle or maybe it's in Portland or maybe it's in Atlanta. So in our case, we did, uh, we did really well in Dallas. And in hindsight, I should have essentially cloned David Steele's model and then done a lot more buildings in, in, in Dallas. We, we made a strategic mistake and bought a lot of buildings in Alberta, right? Had we done the same model in Dallas, we would have you know, also bought 10 or 20 buildings. The market was on fire since 2010 till probably last year. I mean, we did really well. And uh, again, you look backwards and say, well, that was really stupid to not, to, to not do more deals in Dallas, right? We did more deals in Calgary and Edmonton instead. And guess what? We got our ass handed, right? Um, we just sold our smallest building, which is 47 units. So at the moment, I have only three buildings left, two 120 units and one of 71 units, right? So that's a very efficient portfolio to manage. That does not take not even one day a week is probably a busy week, I guess, right? Um, I decided to go into development and I'm trying to learn that business right now, you know, and take out of that mess. So, um, but I think you have a lot of options as a real estate guy. And I think it's, it really, it's a really nice business to be in. So if you, if you are able to raise money and I think with the help of someone like Russell, it helps you to build that platform. You can then decide where you want to take it. You want to buy one building a year or one house in Burnaby a year, or you want to buy one house in Burnaby a month. That's really up to you, right? And, and then maybe if that works in Burnaby, well, then why not go to Portland? That makes sense to you, right? So you decide really where you want to go. And I think that's really said is a really nice platform for that. And has first served me really well over the last yeah, probably 15, 18 years. And you can scale it up and down and retire or semi-retire and, you know, we've done many vacations and, you know, so we're going to go in 10 years. Honestly, I have no idea. Thank you. I sure hope you enjoyed this in-depth training video and I applaud you for sticking around right to the very end. I believe in people that show up put in the work, put in the time and effort should be rewarded. If you're interested in taking the next step, if you're interested in going deeper and mastering what you just learned about in this training video, I encourage you to check out the Raising Capital Academy. So if you have found that you've received some value from the YouTube channel, or maybe you've listened to a podcast, you're only scratching the surface. That truly is just one-tenth of 1% of all the content and materials that have been created that are waiting for you on the other side. So I encourage you to check out the Raising Capital Academy. There's more than 100 plus hours of video content, audio content, exclusive training material for those that are interested in taking the next step, those that are interested in going towards mastery, those that are interested in moving forward with velocity. So I would encourage you wherever you're watching this video, around this video will be a link where you can check out all the details of the Raising Capital Academy. After you've checked out all the details on that page and you're interested in moving forward with Velocity, click on the link that will take you towards the application. This is by application only. This is a community program and is for serious action takers only. So if you want to step up your game, if you have goals and dreams and aspirations for more, if you'd like to make a difference in the financial futures of the most important people in your life, I highly encourage you to check out the Raising Capital Academy. Click on that link and you'll be taken to the next step in the process to see if you qualify to take the next step forward for you. Hope to see you on the other side. Bye for now. If you'd like to continue your journey as a successful real estate investor, only two simple next steps from here. Number one is please subscribe to get all the latest information and latest videos sent directly to you. And over here is a hand-selected video a video that's been hand-selected for you to help you keep moving forward with velocity. Thank you very much.